great to meet so much. But during my lunch, I uh, sat down with my uh, food in front of the TV, distract my mind a bit, and uh, turn it on. And uh, I caught the last half hour of a movie uh, starring Tina Reeves and Al Pacino uh, called The Devil's Advocate. <laughs> now, I'm not recommending that you watch this movie. Uh, in brief, the twisted plot puts Kino Reeves in the role of uh, an incredibly successful young lawyer whose career has been delicately guided and fueled, unbeknownst to him, by his father, who is also, by the way, unknown to him, Al Pacino. Pacino presents a disturbingly compelling portrayal of the devil as he seeks to entice his son into an unholy uh, union. Uh, somebody programming for this channel may have known the gospel reading for this Sunday. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it is uh, a completely twisted and ugly plot looking at the struggle with evil. But Al Pacino's portrayal of the devil is so compelling, so close to what we see in Scripture this morning. Come on! Show me some dazzle. Impress me. <laughs> I reread uh, for this sermon Philip Yancey's chapter on, on the temptation in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. And Yancey is such a great writer. Uh, and this chapter has some of the most insightful uh, uh, thoughts on the subject that, that I've read. That he, he's brilliant. Uh, so I'm finding some of his ideas in this sermon. The book of Luke introduces us to Jesus, the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit in chapter 1, born of the Virgin Mary in chapter 2, and in chapter 3, baptized by John, filled with the Holy Spirit. In our Gospel reading from chapter 4, this morning, he is led by that same Holy Spirit into the desert in order to confront the evil one. I've always viewed this as a one-way test, that Satan is testing and tempting Jesus. But think for a moment about the possibilities of this meeting. What could Jesus, Son of God, with all the power and resources of heaven backing him, what could he have been able to accomplish in this battle against evil in, in that encounter? We know Jesus had the power. Power to work miracles, power over evil spirits, power over the natural laws of this world. He had the power of 12 legions of angels at his immediate back and call according to Matthew chapter 26, verse 23 and 53. Why not deal in this moment with some of the scourges that have been unleashed upon the world as a result of that first meeting between Satan and Adam at the beginning of time and creation? Scourges like natural disasters, earthquakes, famine, viral epidemics. What about stopping war? Why not simply wipe out Satan here and now and save the human race from all this trauma? Satan himself trying to get Jesus to change the rules, take some dazzling shortcuts, feel the power of struggle in this meeting. I mean, there's much more at stake here than Jesus' character. The future of the human race, I believe, hung in the balance at this encounter. Yancey describes it this way. Like single combat warriors, two giants of the cosmos converge on a scene of desolation, one just beginning his mission in enemy territory, arrived in a badly weakened state, the other confident and on home turf seized the initiative. What was the devil's line of defense. 
When Satan met Adam and Eve in the garden, he tempted them with this possibility. Why not be like God? In the temptation of Jesus, he tempted him with the possibility of being human without suffering. To eat bread and eliminate hunger. To eliminate even the necessity of agriculture. Who needs to grow wheat when you can simply turn stones into bread? The curse of Genesis 3 would be broken. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. Genesis 3, verse 17. If you are the Son of God, then be human without pain or suffering. Throw yourself down. If you are God's human Son, then take the power over this world. Do it now without the risk rejection or failure. Forget the struggle. Put on a crown. Satan's temptations centered upon Jesus' reason for coming to this earth. If he had come to be the Messiah, then why not be the Messiah that everyone is hoping for? Give them a king to rule, not just over Israel, but over all the kingdoms of the earth. Eliminate suffering, especially, and most importantly, your own. But as Jesus faced the devil in that desert, he must have known that in order to save others, he could not save himself. The temptation in the desert reveals a profound difference between God's power and Satan's power. How do you change this world of ours? How do you change the hearts and behaviors of men and women? Over the years, I've watched our school systems uh, remove God and faith from classrooms and curriculums in order to teach children how to treat one another, to address the issues of bullying, lying, cheating, sexual promiscuity with rules and with programs and propaganda. Communism attempted to remove God from every aspect of life, but the proponents of communism discovered that their dogma was not enough to make good people. Rather, it engendered a society of indifference and dispassion toward human suffering. How do you reform and motivate people? How do you get them to be good? If the temptation of Jesus teaches us anything, it teaches us that goodness cannot be imposed externally from the top down, but it must, must grow internally from the inside. Satan's power is external and coercive. His power is to coerce, to dance, to force obedience and to destroy. And humanity has learned those tactics so well. Whether it's with a bullwhip, a billy club, or an AK-47, as Yancey would say. Human beings can force other human beings to do anything they want. External and coercive Over the last several years in my neighborhood, occasionally on a morning, a truck with a lot of large backhoe would pull up and unload, unload in front of an empty house around the corner or down the street. In one hour, the house was gone, smashed to smithereens by that backhoe, an irresistible force. I'm told, by the way, that. Research shows operators of heavy equipment have an extremely high job satisfaction rating. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, what a feeling of power and accomplishment. In one hour, you can get rid of the problem. And the results, the visible results are there. External coercive force. God's power is different internal, non-coercive. God's power transforms from the inside out. God's power 
relentlessly depends upon human choice. God is not a Nazi, said Thomas Merton. Indeed, not. In fact, the creator of the world made himself nothing. He humbled himself in order to let human beings make a choice of what they will do with him. Jesus resisted the way of compulsive power to change the world. George MacDonald wrote this. He said, instead of crushing the power of evil by divine force, instead of compelling justice and destroying the wicked, instead of making peace on earth by the rule of a perfect prince, Instead of gathering the children of Jerusalem under his wings, whether they would or not, and saving them from the horrors that anguished his prophetic soul, he let evil work its will while it lived. He contented himself with a slow, unencouraging way of health essential, making men and women good, casting out, not merely controlling it, saving. To love righteousness, is to make it grow, not avenge it. He resisted every impulse to work more rapidly for a lower dream. End quote. Mm. This refusal on the part of Jesus to use force has been referred to as the miracle of restraint. I mean, the fact is that if Jesus, the Son of God, if he is the Son of God, then he could have done any of these things that Satan tempted him with. Turning stones into bread would not have been an obstacle for one who could feed 5,000 a few loaves of fish uh, and bread or, or turn water into wine. The greater miracle is his refusal to use his power to exercise his will over us. Visit us. 